He is risen. There you go. The early church, way back in the first, second century AD, they began that practice, particularly at Easter. He is risen. And the congregation would answer, He is risen indeed. That's what we've been looking at here in the Gospel of John. And, and really, what our brother has been sharing about the unity of these two assemblies into one is a demonstration of his resurrection, isn't it? It demonstrates that he's alive. It demonstrates that we've been brought into the one body, the body of Jesus Christ, and it's real. It's true. And that's one of the things that we've seen here as we're wrapping up this Gospel of John. We began this some 19 months ago, and we're now wrapping up here in John chapter 21 this morning. But before we go to this 11th affirmation, we've, we've looked at 10 of the affirmations of his resurrection that are recorded in the four Gospels. I wanted to go back to the, number four was in John chapter 20, the first part of the chapter. You remember Simon Peter and the Apostle John had been informed by Mary Magdalene that, well, she thought the body had been stolen. And they immediately left. Now, they were in hiding. And I don't judge them for that. I would be too. You would be too. They, they recognized they would probably be next as the religious leaders had crucified their Messiah, their Lord. And so they run to the tomb. And we read in verse 5 of chapter 20, Peter after he entered the tomb, stooping down, looked in and saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. The linen cloths were lying there. But the Lord wasn't there. And it's interesting, I didn't point it out for the sake of time, but over in chapter 11 and verse 44, you remember when our Lord raised Lazarus of Bethany from the dead? You remember the difference? We read in verse 44 of John 11, And he who died, that is Lazarus, the Lord had just called him to come forth, came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. But our Lord wasn't bound hand and foot with grave clothes when he came out. The linen cloths and the handkerchiefs were left behind. So there's a difference. The Holy Spirit is telling us. Lazarus was, we might say, resuscitated, brought back to life, but it wasn't really the resurrection because the Bible is very clear. The Lord Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. And Lazarus would have to die again. And there was an old legend in the early church that Lazarus asked the Lord whether he would have to go through death again because of it was bad enough going through it one time. And the Lord said, yes, yes, you will. You'll have to go through it again. And the, the legend is that Lazarus never smiled again when he realized because he had been through the awfulness of it and the separation that it brings all of us come into this world with a fear of death. And if you don't have a fear of death, there's something wrong. Because the Bible says Satan keeps us bound with the fear of death. That's in Hebrews chapter 2. And so the resurrection brings such hope, such liberty. It's a victory. <laughs> Now, I know it's not Easter. I know it's Mardi Gras. It's not Easter yet. But for those of us who know the Lord as our Savior, it's Easter every day. Amen? Because we are already born again and part of what the Bible calls the new creation. This old creation, including these old bodies. And they're getting older every day. They're corrupting, the Bible says. And this corruptible 
cannot inherit in corruption. They must be changed and God's going to change them. But we're already part of the new creation. Are you living in the new creation today? I was challenged recently. Our brother brought us into Philippians earlier. And uh, the last few weeks, and we'll be, Lord willing, doing a series in Philippians next week in South Carolina. Appreciate your prayer for that. I have an opportunity for a couple of weeks to go over to the southeast again. And in our studies in Philippians in preparation, Philippians chapter 1 verse 21 could be really the key verse in terms of application of the whole letter. You know how it goes? It's very short. To me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Now that's an outlook. That's a perspective on Christ on ourselves, on this world, and on the world to come. And what I was challenged by, and I'm going to challenge you, to take out a sheet of paper, a blank sheet of paper, and write at the top, to me, to live is, and draw a blank. And in your quiet time before the Lord, you don't have to do it right now, but maybe in the week, in weeks to come, to begin to list what you would put in that blank. What are you living for today, really? You begin to list. Most of us, if not all of us, would have to honestly put something in that blank other than Christ, wouldn't we? Paul had been brought to that place. He was an older man by that time. He had known the Lord. He had walked with the Lord. He was in prison for the gospel. He's suffering for the Lord. And he began, to, he came to the, the Lord, brought him to this place where he could say, you know what? Whether I live or die, to me to live is Jesus Christ. It's all about him. He's the center and circumference of my entire existence. If you want to know true liberty and true joy, a lasting joy, you will ask him to help you, as I've asked him to help me, put him in that place, right? And that's really the message here in John chapter 21. One of the things I love about our Lord, he's the master of retrieval. You know, in, in the Luke 15, the, the, the three parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, our Lord goes out and seeks after that sheep Remember, he had 99 in the fold and one got away. And at risk to his own life, he goes out, the shepherd goes out and seeks after that lost one. And does he give up after a few days, after a few thorns and bristles, a few cliffs he almost falls off to get to it? When, how long does he keep seeking after that lost sheep? Until he finds it. Has he found you? today if you're one of those that maybe is kind of drifting away from the Lord maybe you knew him at one time that happens to us you know it happened to the Apostle Peter and we, we looked at this a few weeks ago but it might be good to remind ourselves in in Luke chapter 11 I'm sorry Luke chapter 22 our Lord predicted this about Peter. You remember they were in the upper room. They had ce celebrated the Passover, the last one, and the first Lord's Supper right on the heels of the Passover. And our Lord is predicting, he's telling them he's going to suffer and they're arguing about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. And Peter was very confident in himself. You know anybody like that? You looked in the mirror lately? <laughs> 
<laughs> we all struggle with that being too confident in ourselves, right? Instead of being confident in the Lord. And so our Lord says to him, verse 31, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Ooh. Satan knows who you are. And especially if you're a child of God. Now, we don't know he's Satan has asked that of you or me. We don't know. We know he asked that of Peter. But I don't think many of us are exempt from this. You ever been through the sifter? <laughs> That's not always a bad thing. It's a good thing if we come out of it stronger for the Lord Jesus, isn't it? And our Lord predicts here. First, he predicts that Satan is going to be permitted to sift. You know any other characters in the Bible Satan was permitted to sift? A whole book in the Old Testament written about Job, right? David, for sure, King David, and others were too. But our Lord predicts Peter's restoration. I love this. That's why I say our Lord is the master with a capital M, a master of retrieval. He loves to retrieve those who drift away. As well as save those who are lost. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. The whole book of Hebrews explains our Lord's high priestly ministry. That's what he's doing right now in heaven. He's a high priest of every believer. And he intercedes for you and me by name. Did you know that? Does that make you glad? Does that give you confidence and assurance? It should. Don't put your confidence in your fleshly strength. It will fail every time. Put your confidence in your Lord's strength as your high priest. Whoever lives to make intercession for us, says Hebrews 7.25. So here he does that. He says, I prayed for you. When you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Not if you return to me. When you return. Because I know I'm going to restore you. And this is the restoration described here in John chapter 21. So let's work through this together. Divide it. Really, the first 19 verses is all we'll look at, I think, today. And we'll finish out Gospel of John next time, Lord willing. This would be the 11th affirmation or appearance of our Lord after his resurrection. And there will be more to follow after this one that are recorded in the Bible. So verses 1 through 14, I'm titling that the man on the shore. The man on the shore is the risen Lord Jesus. <laughs> but it's interesting how they find this out. And then verses 15 to 19, the restoration of Peter to ministry. Now, our Lord, you might remember when he appeared to the women at the tomb. Remember, he had a message for them when he sent them in Mark 16. We looked at it. He said to them, go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee and there you will see him. Right. So now they're in Galilee. John likes to call it the Sea of Tiberias because that was the Roman name for the Sea of Galilee. We've kind of defaulted back now that Israel's in the land. We're calling it the Sea of Galilee again. It was called the Sea of Kinnereth before it was called the Sea of Galilee. If you go further back. Fa fabulous, fantastic place. So verse 1, chapter 21. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Now, I don't know that this is 
the prediction our Lord made to the two women at the tomb. I kind of feel like it isn't. That I don't know whether they got restless or doubt was creeping in, but Peter says, I'm going fishing, which was, I know I'm in Cajun territory and you don't say anything bad about fishing around here. And I wouldn't say anything bad about fishing, but don't forget, it's not, Peter's not just doing this as a recreation. That was his trade, his livelihood. He owned a fishing business. He had at least one boat, probably more than one. John and James, the sons of Zebedee, were on another boat. Peter probably owned it. If the house that has been uncovered, archaeologists have uncovered a house in Capernaum near the Sea of Galilee that they're calling Peter's house, of course, a church has been built, cantilevered over the ruins and so forth. You know that happens over there. It's a massive house. It, you know, our Lord brought the, his family from Nazareth to Capernaum to stay there, you remember. So Peter was a significant businessman. Now the resurrection had happened. The Lord had already told them that he was going to use them to take his message to the world. And they were on the heels of one of the hinges of all history, the building of Christ's church, which we're a part of. Because God's still building his church, isn't he? He's going to be doing that all the way up until the rapture. I hope you're plugged in. I hope, you know, that, that's the whole idea. None of us is satisfied until every one of you all of us are involved in the work according to how he's gifted you and called you and what he wants you to be and it's unique for every one of us but none of us is successful until all of us is successful right or that's that's part of the unity of the body that we're talking about here and that's that's where good leadership and mentoring comes in sisters with sisters brothers with brothers couples with couples so Simon Peter, verse 2, Thomas called the twin. We just read about him at the end of chapter 20. Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. We read about Nathaniel way back in chapter 1. You remember of John? And then we had the miracle of the wedding feast at Cana at the beginning of chapter 2. But now we find out Nathaniel was from Cana. We wouldn't have known that. The two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two others unnamed of his disciples were together. Seven of them. And Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Now, Peter was a leader. And God had not only gifted him that way in his own personality, but the Lord Jesus had put him in that position and amongst the group of disciples. And so they said to him, we are going fishing with you also. Sounds good, Pete. Let's go out in the boat. It's interesting you know, there's, you maybe heard the story of the first century boat that's in North Guinnessar in a museum there. It's a museum that, where they have to keep the humidity and the temperature set just right because it was uncovered on the shores of the Sea of Galilee back, I think, in around 86 or so. They'd had a particular time of drought and the Sea of Galilee receded more than it has in a long time. And there was a Jewish man walking along the shore and he saw something sticking up out of the sand. And they brought the antiquities in and dug around it. And it was, and they dated that boat back to the first century. Now that man who was not a Christian, he wasn't a believer. He said, you know, there was something really spectacular about that day. I remember how the sun was rising and, 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 and the way the clouds in the sky were. Something, and he uncovered what may be this very boat. Which is a boat our Lord slept in among other things right preached from it earlier in his public ministry it's a pretty significant boat i don't think the father would have led that man to this boat just by accident and it would be just any first century boat and i stood there and looked at it and thought that's something to see and just imagined you know your imagination so they went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught how much? Had that happened before? 
had had, right? In Luke chapter 5, when Peter was commissioned in the ministry, it happened. You remember. And John seems to recognize that. So they catch nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, and yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. They were near the shore, northern edge of the Sea of Galilee, because that would be where Capernaum is. And the acoustics there are natural. We, we stood down at the bottom of that area on the northern shore, and, and some stood up on the hill and could read just softly, softer than I'm speaking now through this microphone, from the Word of God. And everyone told me they could hear way up on the hill. I guess with the sea behind and the shape, the concave shape, I don't know. But So they, they saw a man on the shore, and he calls out to him. Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. <laughs> I don't know if they all seven said it at once, you know, in harmony or, or just Peter spoke. It's got you, you kind of think about how, no. I mean, I don't know if they said it emphatically or no. I imagine after they fished, during the night and caught nothing. I imagine they said, no. Why are you asking? Remember, these are expert fishermen. That was why when our Lord told him earlier to cast the net on a certain side of the boat. Peter didn't even, you know, Peter's thinking, I'm the fisherman here. You're just a carpenter. You're going to tell me where the fish are. The Lord said, cast nets, plural, and he only cast one because he obviously didn't think there was going to be any catch. We do that too sometimes, don't we? When our Lord urges us in a particular line of ministry. So he gives a command. Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find. <laughs> to expert fishermen. You've got the net on the wrong side of the boat. Now, the Lord Jesus created the fish. He created the mountains. He created the Sea of Galilee. He created the currents. He created the law of buoyancy that held the boat up. As our brethren reminded us earlier, he is God in a human body. God. Your creator and mine visited this earth. His name is Jesus. So when he recommends or commands that they do this, it's a good idea to do it, isn't it? By the way, you remember in the upper room back in chapter 15, you remember what our Lord, when he gave the parable of the vine and the branches, and he was talking about fruitfulness in service and ministry. In other words, having a successful, fruitful life. You want a fruitful life? I do. I want that for me and I want that for you. And you remember what he said? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, how much did you catch? Nothing. Through this, maybe we could call it an enacted parable. He's showing them in a visual event that they actually experienced what they were doing in their own souls. They were getting moving away from him as the center. And that produced emptiness. <laughs> Nothing. If you're in that place in your own life, and you're a child of God. There's always hope, isn't there? Because the Lord Jesus wants to make every one of us fruitful for him. But a lot of that depends on you and me, doesn't it? Do we want that? To me, to live is... And when it's Christ, then dying is gain. Because <laughs> we're going to be with him, see? You see how valuable and important the truth of the resurrection is? 
I know we celebrate it at Easter and we have all kinds of festivities, but resurrection and understanding and applying it for a born again Christian is absolutely essential to everyday living. And so what are they going to do? Well, they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Lo and behold, move the net like he did what he asked them to do, and they produce fruit. You see the formula, if we could call it that? Remember what Mary had said to the servants way back at the wedding feast in Cana? Whatever he says to you, do it. Remember? <laughs> That's still true. If you're being called of the Lord for a particular line of service, whatever he says to you, do it. Be fruitful and multiply. Be useful. You say, well, how, how long do I have to wait? How old do I have to be? <laughs> If you're a young person, you should be starting now to yield yourself to the Lord. And if you're an old person, it's not too late. If you're still breathing, the things you can do for the Lord, it'll be limited. You've wasted your whole life on nothing, emptiness, vanity. But it'll be limited because of physical weakness and other things that come with old age. But we can all be useful of the Lord, can't we? Wouldn't it be great if every one of us today set down a banner, a marker, a flag right here today and say, from here on, I'm going to live for Christ. It's amazing what the Lord would be able to do in this place if we would just do that. Every one of us, because everyone's important. God has brought you here. And so, therefore, John says in verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who is John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it while he was fishing, and plunged into the sea. Now, normally you would take off the outer garment to go into the sea, <clears throat> but apparently out of respect for the Lord, he puts on the outer garment, and that's how strong he is. He, he just, he's not going to wait for the boat to get there. He's going to swim. Now, the boat's not out in the middle of the, the lake, but it's fairly close to shore. They could see the man on the shore. And he swims in. And then he single-handedly drags the fish in, <laughs> the whole net, by himself. This was a big guy, Peter. And the Lord says to them in verse 12, Come and eat breakfast. Come and dine. One brother has written a series of devotional works titled that from this passage, Come and Dine. And your time in the morning when you start your day, come and dine with the Lord in his word, right? Brother Ramey, I think he just went home to be with the Lord up in Chicago last year, I think it was. But Bob Ramey, maybe some of you knew him. He had a slogan that he would teach the people, no Bible, no breakfast. And he said, and I like to eat. And looking at him, he, I could tell he liked to eat because I met him. No Bible, no breakfast. Dine with the Lord first. Spend time with him. And that comes from making it a priority. And then verses 15 to 19, then our Lord looks at Peter. Now, some of the commentaries suggest that maybe our Lord, in kindness to Peter, drew him aside privately for this, but the text does not indicate that. So our Lord restores Peter in front of the other six. I could see value to that. They all heard the prediction back in Luke 22, you remember, they were all there, the upper room. And they would get value from this lesson too. Follow with me. Verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, turn right to him. Simon, notice he calls him by his old name. Peter is the name he gave him as his servant. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? 
Now the question is, what is the these referring to? Is the these referring to the fish, the 153 fish they caught? Do you love me more than just catching fish? Could be referring to that. Or it could be refer referring to the other disciples because Peter kind of gave an indication that they may all fail you, but I won't fail you, Lord. I love you more than these. That, that he did, did give that indication. It could be either or both. The key is, Simon, do you love me? Has that surprised you that the Lord would follow that technique? Well, when you know the heart of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 <clears throat> teaches us that anything we do apart from love as our motive, that is love for God and love for the people, profits us how much? Nothing. Just like this catch of fish. Nothing. What a waste of time. You're like the squirrel going around in a squirrel cage and spending all kinds of energy, making all kinds of heat, producing nothing in the end, right? A whole life like that. I met a man like that some years ago. I was talking to him and he was in a hospital bed. He said, Thomas, I've, I've wasted my whole life. I knew the Lord. I received him as Savior when I was 22 at a camp. We got some camp people here today. We're glad for him. He was at a camp. But he got involved in what we would call life. It's not really life because life is walking with the Lord, isn't it? According to the Bible. But we call it life. You know, business, career, children, education. And now he's 74 at the time I'm talking to him. And he's looking back. He could die. And he realizes, what have I done with it? You know, every day we start the day with some 86,000 seconds, right? 24 hour day. And you know, once we've used them, they're gone. We can't go back and relive them. To me, to live is Christ. To use the time he's given us optimally for him. It's a choice. And that's what he's saying to Peter. Peter answers him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep. He said to him the third. Now, how many times did Peter deny the Lord? Three times, right? And you remember where Peter was when he denied the Lord? In a courtyard at the house of Caiaphas. And you remember it was a cold night that night and they were standing by the fire warming themselves. And John makes a particular point here that there was a set of coals fire here at the breakfast. I, I don't know if the Lord was trying to make a connection in Peter's heart, but very likely so. The Lord's reaching out to him. The Lord wants him to be restored. He wants you and I to be useful and restored more than we want it sometimes. Amen? <laughs> How amazing he is. So he says to him the third time, and Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Now the Lord begins with a different word. You know, in the English we use the word love. In the Greek they had four different words for love. Only three of them are used in the Bible, I think. But agape love unconditional, self-sacrificial love. That's the first questions that the Lord asked Peter the first and second time. And Peter answers them each one of the times with phileo love, brotherly love, a good love, an affectionate love. But Peter's not assuming that he can do agape love himself, and that's good. Because we can only do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, the Lord even, he, he changed the term to phileo, the, affectionate love the third time and 
And Peter's grieved. Why do you keep asking me this? You are omniscient. You know all things. Why does the Lord ask questions? Because he wants us to think. Not because we can give him information that he doesn't know. Amen? Do you believe God's omniscient? Do you believe Jesus is omniscient? He knows all things. So Peter says, you know all things. You know that I love you. And notice that the command, feed my lambs. The lambs would be the newer believers. Feed them like a shepherd feeds with instruction from the word of God. Tend my sheep. That's the word pastor or shepherd the sheep. That's the same word Peter uses in 1 Peter 5 when he refers to himself not as a pope but as an elder and a shepherd. And he commands the elders to point mine, to shepherd the sheep. <laughs> and that would be the older ones. And then to tend the sheep or feed them in verse 17. And then the Lord gives a prediction again in verse 18 of Peter's martyrdom. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and put your clothes on and walk where you wished. I mean, you were in charge, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. And John tells us, there isn't enough information in that verse to know that it means his martyrdom, right? Could mean other things, just difficulties in ministry, which we know Peter suffered in Acts, this he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. Now, tradition is that Peter was crucified and Eusebius, which I consider not a reliable source sometimes as a historian, uh, says that he was crucified upside down and that's a legend, we don't know that. We know he was martyred for the Lord, that's the key. He told the Lord, I'll lay down my life for you in chapter 13 in the upper room. And he does. And our Lord concludes, when he had spoken this, he said to him two words. Follow me. And that's the words he has for you and me this morning. This is a special celebration today. And there's some things that are going to happen as we conclude the message today that will be special too. But let's keep in focus the truth that John 21 is teaching us. When we are unified together in serving the Lord and doing what he's called and equipped us to do, we are a powerhouse for the Lord. But when we're divided, which Satan is always trying to divide God's people, we become very weak and ineffective. You know what the key is to unity? Keeping Christ central. <laughs> to me, to live is, think about it. Think about it this week. Maybe there's some priorities that you need to rearrange. Believe me, I'm doing that in my own life too. And follow the Lord Jesus. Follow him. Amen. If you don't know the Lord is your Savior today, talk to one of us after. Some of the leaders will be up here in a minute and you will see who they are and would be privileged to help you see from the Word of God before you go out those doors, you can know for sure that you're saved and that you have a part in this great work of God in building his church. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this instruction from the Apostle John. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who helps us, enables us to understand it and to teach it to us, each one of us, where we are, how we are, what we're doing now. And help us to apply it, to go on to this week, not just to be hearers only, but hearers and doers of your word, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for this celebration today. We thank you for the merger, which you did. Brothers, it was right. It's a miracle. But you're a miracle-working God. 
and we love you for it. So we thank you. Be with us as we part. Take us home safely. We thank you for your great love. We pray in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen.